اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الصلاه والسلام على اشرف الانبياء وسيد المرسلين حبيبنا وشفيع نفوسنا اب القاسم محمد المصطفى صلى الله عليه واله وسلم وعلى اله الطيبين الطاهرين الغر الميامين المظلومين ولعنه الله على اعدائهم اجمعين Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to our show, dear brothers and sisters, respected viewers. You're watching us live on Imam Hussein TV, and this is T3. Teach, talk, and thrive, inshallah. Uh, as always, I am your host, uh, Ali Al Burji, and with us, none other but Sayyid uh, Shabir Kirmani. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa How are you? Very well. How are yeah. you? Yeah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Amin. Halfway through, unfortunately, uh, of Shahar Ramadan. Thankfully. And uh, Alhamdulillah, I've already been experiencing the blessings of it. I already feel cleaner, mashallah. Uh, fasting has been very good for me. How about you, for yourself? Alhamdulillah, it's been very good. Keeping busy so that the, the, you know, the days fly by. But of course, we miss Shahar Ramadan. We don't want to be uh, deprived of this. Blessed month. Ahsantum, ahsantum. Uh, with that being said, inshallah, we'd like to start our show. As you may know, always time is uh, applying pressure on us. Today's topic is which industries are encouraged by Islam for us to use or engage in for uh, our livelihoods or if we want to um, go into a business. Uh, our previous episode, we're discussing about wealth. And whether wealth was the best uh, form of aid for faith. And obviously we've come to a very beautiful conclusion that indeed wealth, subject to one's intention, can be the best weapon in order to build and from there on improve upon and have um, a very good positive effect on our community and, and the world as a whole. Now, inshallah, we would like to start... Uh, by discussing uh, a businessman. If we took a businessman in its raw shape and form, and the question we want to pose upon it is, what traits must a businessman have in order to be successful? Bismillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. When we look at what type of traits a successful businessman or businesswoman should have for that matter, um, our first point of reference should be Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam. So that is, what, what types of traits did Rasulullah have himself, the Holy Prophet have himself? What types of traits did Lady Khadija have? Yes. What type of traits did she have? When, what did she bring to the business table? What type of mm. ethics and traits did she bring? Yes. And when we look at that, when we analyze that, we need to, some traits come forward for us. So for example, as we mentioned with respect to Rasulullah, you noticed he was Sadiq and Amin. Honest and trustworthy. He was very honest whenever he was doing a dealing with anyone. You knew that he was not going to cheat you. He's not going to lie, cheat, or steal. And the same with his trustworthiness, that people would keep their trust with him, their amana. They would put. They would say, we trust you. Even though they were not Muslims many a times. They were people from Mecca. They said, we don't know anyone more reliable than you, more honest, trustworthy than you. And they would give him that. So this is. these are some very clear things. I'm, I'm quite certain that Lady Khadija brought similar traits to the table. That is, that she had this ability to be honest, sincere, trustworthy as well. And her loyalty to Rasulullah during her life, that was exemplified through her marriage with Rasulullah. And how she stuck by Rasulullah side by side throughout. Mm. And so I think she also understood, as Rasulullah understood, that business is ultimately about relationships. Treat people the same way you would want to be treated and give honest, be honest, fair, and equitable, and also create win-win scenarios, and you will succeed and thrive in business over time. Okay. This uh, is the Ahlul Bayt Ali Ahsantum. I just want to be a devil's applicant, mm -hmm. uh, advocate, sorry, here. Sure. And uh, I want to say that a lot of people may come to you and say, Sayyidna, uh, I disagree. And the world we live in, it's the survival of the fittest. Mm. It's like the law of the jungle. Mm. Yeah, the strongest will eat on the weak. Mm. Yeah, and they may come and give you examples. Oh, look at this entrepreneur. Look at this businessman. Look at that. They're all successful millionaires, billionaires, for example, and they're ruthless. Mm. Yeah. Now, someone may argue as well that yes, mm. being good to people, um, the secret in a, a healthy um, business is relationships and mm. building bridges. A lot of people put on their poker face. Yeah, smile, treat you like a prince, tell you whatever you want to hear. Mm. 
But at your back, they'll backbite you, they'll stab you as soon as they get their first uh, chance. Yeah? How can we debate this in a way that to prove that, listen, you can be successful in this world, in, this, in any field, without adapting the traits of these people. Stick to the akhlaq and the uh, doctrines of Ahlul Bayt and the Holy Prophet وعلي, and you can be successful. How can I put this into a debate and convince people? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a good question because that way, if one wants to approach business in an unethical way, you can still be successful from a worldly perspective. Yes, it's possible. Yes. You can lie, cheat, steal. You may make a good income. And there's many examples of this in the world that people have chose to do it that way. Mm. The question is, can you sleep at night? Can you put your head on your pillow and actually like sleep with yourself? And, and even further than this, some people go to the level and the depths of evil that they can even justify to themselves what they're doing. Although it's wrong, they'll justify it mm. to be able to do that. There's a tradition that we're told that, or, or, or a story that we're told that uh, Amil Mumin asked a man to look after his saddle when he went in the masjid. And uh, this man, when Amil Mumin came back, he was gone. And he went to uh, Emil Mumin, he's going in the bazaar in the market, and he sees his saddle for sale, you know. And so he says, wow, I mean, I had intended, and he said, ask the price from the shopkeeper. And he said that I had intended to give this man a wage or some salary or some income for his service. But he chose to make his income in a deceitful way, in the wrong way. The income that was written from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from God Almighty, was written for him. But he chose which way he wanted to achieve it, righteously or wrongfully. And the same is true for us every single day. We have the risk or the sustenance that is written for us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the question is, do we want to achieve it the right way or the wrong way? And this is what's really important. So now coming back to Ahlul Bayt salam and the traits for what makes somebody successful in business day in and day out. I'm very convinced that one of the traits that you must have to be successful at a high level, and I believe the Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam had, no, was no. to think big. Think at a very high level. What do you mean? And what I mean by that is that doesn't mean that just think that, you know, I want to just open this one cafe and I want it to be successful. Although that's a very good profession, it's a very noble profession. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is your why must be very compelling. Why you're doing what you're doing must be very compelling. Meaning that I want to start a business and I just want to make some money for myself. One way of thinking about it. Another way of thinking about it, I want to start a business to employ others in my community, help establish them, to help give charity locally and abroad. I want to strengthen my community at a global level and I want to earn big. Because my, my projects are big, my goals are big. The way you say it, how I see it is that think big, meaning have bigger goals. Mm. You must have ambition, very true. You must have big goals, you must have high degree of ambition. And this is very important. Sometimes in our communities, people lack ambition. Meaning that, you know, Alhamdulillah, I'm good, I have my income paid. Contentment is different than ambition. What I mean by that is, and we discussed this in previous episodes, that if I think that Alhamdulillah, I have my, my bills paid from myself and my immediate family, and I don't have any obligation to other Muslims, then I'm thinking small. I need to think big at the point that I should be giving a million dollars in charity. Inshallah, we all get to that point. Inshallah. But the notion is, why? what am I going to do with my, my wealth? The wealth is a vehicle. So it's the cause that can drive us towards it. Exactly. Having a big cause. Mm. So a big goal is extremely important. A big cause is very important. A big uh, something that you're striving towards. Um, there's a saying that you know, shoot for the moon, even if you miss, you'll land amongst the stars. And it gets to this notion that many times we may set very high goals, and we may miss them a little bit. But if you set a very short goal, then you're not striving for much, right? And sometimes you miss that. You need to have an audacious goal that, for example, I want to end water shortages in the world, for example, or on a whole continent. This is a really good, ambitious goal. Mm. This, is how, this is how you start, need to start thinking. Same with Ahlul Bayt Rasulullah's vision was to change the world. As it was a divine mission, but Lady Khadija was part of that mission as well. That she says, very well, this is a very ambitious project. We want to change Arabia, the whole atmosphere of, of, of the world ultimately. 
Well, it's going gonna, it's gonna to require a lot of income, for example. So Lady Khadija put her income on the line. The same comes with business. I, as an individual, should have big dreams and big goals. And once we have those big goals, number one, number two, you must have confidence to execute on them. You must have conviction. Now for a Muslim, where do you get confidence and conviction from? It comes from the Ahlul Bayt Ali Muslim. It comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ultimately. That I know that if I put my hard work and my soul into this task, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, having tawakkul, trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the highest level, He will provide for me. Because my goal is not about me anymore. Sometimes when my goal is just about me, Maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not give because Allah knows for you as an individual having too much wealth is not good. Oh my God. Allah because this could be your do- downfall. Because you may become material, you may begin to party, you may begin to become loose in your ethics. You may, for you it's not good. But if you broaden the objective for the benefit ah. of others as well, mm. then it's one more reason, a greater reason for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring you that up. Very good. Oh e- my exactly. God. Exactly. So number one, think big. Number two, have confidence in your achieving the goal, have conviction, don't doubt yourself. Have absolute trust in yourself and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because your trust in yourself is tied to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As a believer, in salah, throughout your life, that I am doing this, Ya Allah, assist me in this process because I want to do good for the world. I want to do good for humanity and see the blessings come, inshaAllah. It may take time, it does take patience. There's no, I'm not talking about getting rich overnight. I'm not talking about becoming wealthy overnight. And although Allah, there's no, Allah can do this. There's no barriers to Him doing that. But success requires hard work. We need to accept that. It's not something that happens in even a year or two. Sometimes it takes several years. Sometimes it takes 10 years. It could be less, it could be more. But hard work and striving, these are very important components of it. The other is be the ability to, to manage myself and my emotions and my thoughts and my feelings. To be more positive. You know, I was reading a study that entrepreneurs, successful entrepreneurs, they have to be a little bit more un- optimistic. That most successful ent- entrepreneurs, they're a bit more optimistic than the general, general public. And you kind of need that. Because it can be a very daunting journey. It can be a very difficult journey, the journey of entrepreneurship and business. Because everything, the, the whole line, it's not a straight line that you follow. You have to tread a path and sometimes you're start making circles around there. You know, somebody asked uh, Elon Musk, Elon Musk, a very famous entrepreneur uh, in our world. Oh, he's world. well known throughout the world now. Very he's well known. He's attracted a lot of attention with the SpaceX programs and yes. Tesla cars. Exactly. He started with PayPal. He was one of the founders of PayPal. Really? And uh, Yes, and him and Peter Thiel and some others, he was one of the founders of PayPal. And then he started Tesla and SpaceX and uh, okay. Solar City. He's a chairman of Solar City as well. And he was somebody who was, who was ma- and many other entrepreneurs as well, but... Elon Musk once said that, you know, entrepreneurship is like staring into space and chewing glass. As in, it's such a difficult thing. And um, Steve Jobs said something similar that, you know, you have to love what you do as an entrepreneur. Otherwise, any rational, sane person would give up. You need to be a little like, you need to be a little obsessed with the process. And the process is about doing good for humanity. That's why I said at the beginning, your why needs to be very important, very compelling. Why you're doing everything. Am I doing this to help the mission of Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam? Am I doing this to help Muslims? Am I doing this to end poverty? Am I doing this for big reasons? If you don't have a strong why, you'll give up over time. That's the big thing. That's why I'm saying, that's why I mentioned why some of successful entrepreneurs have said, it's very hard, it's not easy. But if your why is strong enough and you believe that this is your mission in life, then you will go through whatever obstacle and difficulty to achieve your goal and your success in life. And that's really the essence of it. Confidence in yourself. First of all, dreaming big. Dreaming, we need to encourage it. Number two, we need to encourage confidence in oneself and control over one's mindset. That I have the control over my mentality and all success starts from here, from the brain. And number four, very interesting, we, we should encourage failure. Failure is actually a very strong trait of a successful entrepreneur. A true entrepreneur understands that failure is just part of the journey to success. You need to fail. And we need to encourage people to fail big. But once you fail, don't give up. Keep going. 
the th- reason that people don't succeed after that first or second failure is because they give up. In reality, we learn extremely valuable lessons from our failures that we don't necessarily learn from our successes. Many times in life, if you're very successful, you become complacent. Oh, I succeeded in there. For example, you won a, a soccer match or a basketball match or some sporting event. And you're like, we did great. So you become you, euphoric, you become very happy, which is good, no problem. But at the same time, when you lost that game or that match, you keep thinking to yourself, why did we lose? What did I do wrong? What was wrong with my strategy? How can we play better next time? For example, maybe I didn't defend so well. Maybe our team didn't defend so well. Or for example, maybe we didn't, we didn't bring our energy to the level we should have brought our energy. Or whatever reason it was. Maybe their strategy was better. Maybe they were better at defense, for example. Whatever. When you fail, you learn very valuable lessons at life. And it makes you ponder on them. We sometimes see someone did not do so well in business or maybe fail the first time. We think, oh, it's not meant for them. No. It could very well be meant for them. But the reality of the matter is that this is part of the journey to success. And, and, and this is what happens. I mean, you know, and it's not just... And number, number five, I would say, is execution. Execution is extremely important. In fact, it is what makes business business. It is what, make, it is what makes entrepreneurship entrepreneurship. Execution. And what I mean by that is, a great idea is a dime a dozen. Great ideas come and go. But who executes on those ideas? Uber. Many people have heard of Uber. I mean, most people of the viewers probably used it at some point in time. There was, a, there was a company a few years before Uber called Magic Taxi. I don't think anyone knows about Magic Taxi. It was the same concept, same idea, same everything. Why aren't they here? Sometimes it requires a bit of timing. Sometimes it requires execution, better execution. There's different facets. But really, truly, what makes a successful business is proper execution and not giving up. Persistence and tenacity would be number six. Persistence and tenacity that I'm not going to give up until and unless this is done. That's a vital trait. If you're going to give up, you'll, you, you're going to struggle as an entrepreneur. You need to be persistent. I was listening to an, in, an interview from one of the best uh, salespeople in the world. And he said, he told me his, he was talking about his technique of hiring a salesman, which is very interesting uh, to me. He said he's, he has a few minutes of an interview with each individual. And he said, I would line up maybe 50 people in an hour block or something like that, a short. And he said that, you know, um, I have all these people lined up for meetings in the next few minutes and within the next hour. Why should I hire you? Why, why, why are you the best? And then he said, I would proceed to tell them, you're not the best salesman. And he said, many people would tell me that, you know, oh, maybe you're right. Okay, thanks, bye. And he said, the ones that I would always hire are the ones that are saying, well, maybe you need to listen more closely. For example, he said that, you know, he said one time I remember I hired a guy. Who, I said to him, you know, I'm not hearing a successful salesman from you. And he said, he responded to me, well, maybe you're deaf. He said, I'm, I've raised sales in every company I've worked with in an ethical, honorable, and, and straightforward way. My sales are, And he was fighting back and forth with me. He said, that's what I was looking for. That's the type of persistence I was looking for. That's the type of conviction I was looking for. That's the type of energy I was looking for that they're not going to give up until they create a win-win scenario for both sides. You know, true people who have a high level of vision in, in business, they are adamant about these things, about being driven towards success, working very hard, and not giving up, and being honest and trustworthy. I'm not saying that people who are deceitful and lie, and lie, cheat, and steal, they don't get something. Many people do lie, cheat, and steal, and they end up getting something. But sooner or later, later they do become exposed. People do find out about it, and then their graph starts to fall. If you want to play the long game and you want to do things right, I think the honest and integrity aspect is the most important, which would come to point number seven, which is integrity is extremely important. I remember I was reading uh, Made in America, Sam Walton, the man who came up with Walmart, and he said that what I look for in my management staff, the number one thing is integrity. They must have the highest level of integrity. And uh, Amazon founder Jeff Bezos has, has replicated that as well in terms of his model. He built his company, Amazon, on this principle of, uh, of uh, Sam Walton, that you must have integrity in business in order to succeed over the long run. It's a very important component. Ah, Santum. 
That's very good. My question now is how do I train myself to keep that momentum mm. in order to reach the goal mm. I want to reach? Mm. Even though I get, may get battered, failed and keep going. How do I train myself or mm. what qualities do I need to um, attain in mm. order for me mm. to have that constant energy and that constant remembrance of of the goal and be motivated and never stop and never give up and keep going. Where do I find that from? Very good. Now, I've been using and I will use some <coughs> names of entrepreneurs. That doesn't mean I necessarily mm. agree with everything they say, right? Mm. I'm just giving a principle within that. Let's just leave it to what they're saying yes. at that moment in time. But with respect to uh, Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam, because that's our reference point, um, at every point in time, Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam would encourage us to strive for success in this world and use this world as a means for the Akhirah, which requires persistence. Meaning, when I want to be a good Muslim, I need persistence. For example, I don't want to read Salah. I'm very tired, Fajr Salah, for example. I don't want to get up, I don't want to do this, but I need to <coughs> have that discipline in my life that I will get up, pray when I have to pray. <coughs> Or sometimes there's difficulties in terms of fasting. Maybe someone says the fa hours of fasting are very long in London, for example. I don't want to fast. Well, you need to have that discipline. This is why in the first episode when we began, we said that Ramadan, Shah Ramadan, is a beautiful time for us to remind ourselves about that conviction and belief and, and strengthening our why and disciplining ourselves. But I remember a quote, I believe it was from Mark Cuban, that every no... In sales, for example, every no gets me closer to a yes. Which this quote resonated with me. The reason was, when you, for example, are cold calling or you're in a business, for example, you're, you have to become accustomed to rejection. You have to get accustomed to people saying no. But if you look at it, rather than, this is not just a no, that maybe every 10, if I call 10 people, one of them is going to be a yes. But when I get a no, 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 I'm just getting closer to that yes, which will happen on the ninth or 10th time. So this is very important to note. Persistence comes from there. Persistence also comes that belief, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told me that I should endeavor and strive in business. And that's what I should do. We have traditions that tell us that business commerce to do tijara is actually part of the dignity of the belief, of the believer. Okay. Our sixth Imam Ali Musalam is attributed to have said, he saw a man who was running late for work. He, was in, he, he had a job maybe in the market. He said, he said, go towards your dignity. Why are you delaying yourself from your dignity? Imagine, we may think I'm sitting in the bazaar and I'm trying to sell something humble. Maybe dates, do not forget Maytham at Tamar or some of the companions. And he's selling something humble. No, the Ahlul Bayt said, this is your dignity to work hard and honest and, and strive in business. And we should admire that and take that on board in our lives. That Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam said, no. Do not think that if you go and work in the bazaar, this is undignified. No, this is your dignity. This is your honor. Work hard, strive hard, and leave the rest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He'll take care of it. Um, inshallah, we'll pause for a short while, and uh, we'll be right back uh, with you, dear brothers and, and sisters. So stay tuned. See you in a bit. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back, uh, my dear brothers and sisters, respected viewers. Inshallah, um, just before we continue, I'd like to let you know that now our lines are open. For any of you who'd like to call and join our discussion or even ask a Sayyid the question, by all means, I urge you to do so. Uh, the uh, landline number is 0203 I repeat, 0203 Five one five zero one double nine, and you should have um, WhatsApp available for you. If you don't want to call, you can uh, text the question, and the number should be available at the uh, bottom of your screens. With that being said, uh, would like to uh, enter with regards to today's uh, topic regarding which industries are recommended, yeah, uh, or encouraged, I might say, by Islam um, for us to engage in. Mm. Sure. So there's a number of <coughs> different industries that Islam has highly encouraged for us to pursue. 
Um, and of course, these are all with ethics and all those prerequisites that we had uh, we had uh, discussed in previous episodes. Also, Amir al Mu'minin is attributed to have said, and he has said uh, uh, that um, someone before they endeavor in business, they should strive and they should try their best in order to become acquainted with the fiqh, the jurisprudence of business. Meaning that they should know the rules and regulations of Islam with respect to business before they endeavor. And this is, this is very important because they don't want to have negligence or they don't want to say that, you know, I made this mistake Islamically but I didn't know. So you should become acquainted with this. However, given all that, there are certain fields that are highly recommended. For example, agriculture, farming and the likes have been highly recommended by Islam and one should endeavor in that. We're told that Amin al-Mu'mineen himself, when he was younger, uh, during his uh, dur- during the 25 year period, for example, where his right was taken, during that time, he would he was once seen taking a sack on his back towards the towards um, the forest, if you will, or towards you know. Um, and when he was going, a man asked him, "Yeah, Ali, what is it that you have or you're taking on your back?" He says, "Date palms, inshallah." And uh, at that point, of course, it was not date palms because date palms would be huge. You know, how mm. would he? He was actually carrying seeds. Mm. And he planted those seeds and he created orchards Mashallah. from which he derived date palms and he began to do business over time. Allah so he Allah started Allah from Allah scratch, Allah. literally, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. But over time he became so wealthy that he freed, as we mentioned in Asul Kafi, you have traditions that say that Amir al-Mu'mineen with his own money, he freed over a thousand slaves. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Amir al-Mu'mineen who was one of, living one of the most humble lives. Now where did that come from? His own father was a very good businessman, Abu Talib, may Allah bless him. He saw that in his life. He saw his, his, his cousin, Rasulullah himself, doing business. These were tradesmen, businessmen. And that really had a big impact in encouraging his success, Amir al muminin and that confidence that he had. Of course, these are all lessons for us. Ahlul Bayt are divine representatives. But agriculture is highly recommended. Another field that is highly recommended by Islam is actually real estate. Which many people would be like, wow, real estate. Yeah, and this relates to farming and agriculture, but even further than this. Numerous traditions of the Ahlul Bayt salam, have been found that, that make a distinguishment between silent property and, for example, active property or real property. And silent property is the Ahlul Bayt salam, were actually not in support of having money just lying around. Cash or just wealth just lying around. Ahlul Bayt encouraged us to use our wealth actively to develop our society, our community to the best ability possible. That we should not just be uh, keeping money and hoarding wealth, if you follow what I'm saying. That I should not just accumulate and accumulate and accumulate and become a millionaire and sit on my piles of money. No, I should use that wealth and invest in property and I should help build and develop society. We are told there's a Tradition that we are told that is attributed to the sixth Imam Ali Musalam that a man came to him and he said, Yabda Rasulillah, I have a property. That I live and I have a property. And people have made big offers to me. They've made many offers to me to buy this property. What should I do, Yabna Rasulullah? You know, sometimes when the offers start getting really good, you're like, I want to stay here, but then the offers start climbing, you're like, Well, maybe I should reconsider. He goes to the Imam Ali Musalam says that the one who trades who trades mud and cement or mud and water actually, who trades mud and water not for mud and water, has made a mistake. Mud and water referring to property, meaning the cement and bricks that you make a property with. One who trades it for maybe wealth instead of actually buying another property has made a mistake. He says, he says, but Yabna Rasulullah, what if I take this property and the income that comes from it and buy a bigger, better property? Ah, then the Imam is, a, is attributed to have said that this is good, this is something that there is no objection in, and this is a good thing to do. Meaning that someone from Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam, who's a follower of the Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam, you should retain property. And only use that or only sell that property if you plan and intend on buying a bigger, better property. This is very important to note. Why property? Because Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam have also further said to us, again the sixth Imam, that when someone 
is attributed to have said, when someone buys a property, they have something that they can use. For example, God forbid they pass away, their dependents, their family who remains, they still have something that they can liquidate, they can sell it and use that property. Or they still have something where they can rent out some portion of the house. They still have ultimately some other way of making income. Oh, oh I would think maybe as well control of land. Mm, exactly. So eventually when a community would grow, they would owe the land they live in as well. Yes. And then we see it through the Imams, if you think about it, oh, yes. the Imams. Even, yes. for example, Abu Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam. He went and he bought the land of Karbala in which he was martyred. In. Subhanallah. So the Imams, even the, the location where they're buried, mm. they bought the land. It's mm. not like a random location. So that makes a lot of sense. How important it is. Absolutely. He bought um, uh, Aba Abdullah sallallahu alayhi He bought the land and he gifts it back to the people. Imagine what generosity Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam yeah, had. Where did that income come from? Aba Abdullah who worked very hard and strived very hard himself. To the extent that we even know his mother Fatima Zahra sallallahu alayhi alayha, That she would manage the affairs of Fadak. From a management standpoint, she didn't necessarily go there. But the bookkeeping and things mm. and the affairs of Fadak, she... She kept those in line and control, meaning that the Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam they had this heritage of enterprising, of for example strategy, of for example business, real estate, agriculture. All of these things were very important to the Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam. And as you mentioned very correctly, that Aba Abdullah himself bought that property, or numerous times Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam would encourage one to buy property, to strive in property as much as possible. There was a tradition we're told, for example, a man had a very, very big house. A Bayt, a member of the Bayt passed by and said, this is a very big property. And people began to think that, you know, this is negative. This, that, you know, why, why is it that someone has such a huge house? And maybe there's a few people. It's, it's a fair question, right? You're someone who's one or two people living in a house and it's a huge mansion. A Bayt Ali Muslim said, this same house or this same mansion can be turned into a place of God. How? By making it of use to the Muslims or the members of the community, for example. We'll open up some of the rooms. You know, now, mashallah, today, people use Airbnb. They use this app so they can rent out some, maybe one or two rooms within their house. They have a big house. Mm. So maybe you can help other people out by maybe not renting it so high. You give a decent margin, you make some income, and they have a place to live as well. So Islam is very practical and pragmatic in this regard. And there's traditions found in this respect. Islam is very forward-thinking religion that highlights these components. So agriculture, highly recommended. Real estate, highly recommended. Numerous others. Trust-keeping is also recommended. We're told, for example, a man came and he was... He wanted to come. He came to the sixth imam. He says that, Yabna Sullah, I have people who are giving their trust to me. They have, mon they have money that they've kept with me. And they want to, for example, they want to, there's too much money. And I feel a responsibility and I feel anxiety to keep it. You see, Ibn Rasulullah, I want to give them back their money and I want to just forsake this world, this dunya. He said, do you want to, his, he sent his son to send this message. When his son sent this message, Imam Ali Musalam is attributed to have said, do you want to wage war on your own nafs? Do you want to wage war on yourself? He said he must not do this. He must continue to strive in this regard, get income, and he must help his dependents and the Muslim community. Now, I'm question sorry. with regards to trust keeping, because when you said trust keeping, first thing that came to my mind is banking. Mm. And obviously, when I think of banking, for X, Y, Z reasons, the first thing I think of is usurpy, riba. Now, trust keeping, question. If you can enlighten me by all means, how could someone profit from trust keeping? Sure. So typically you're, you're correct. We want to stay away from usury. We want to stay away from riba, which is exorbitant amounts of interest. This is not acceptable. Loan sharking, things like this, Islam does not accept, for example. But however, in banks or in other places, for example, you find what are called safekeeping locations. So you pay a fee. And you keep, we have this in America, it's very common. And you, they basically give you a safe. And it's, it's something that 
you're able to keep your valuables there and charge a fee. Okay. There's no objection Islamically uh, that I'm aware of and from this Because you're providing a service. You're providing way. a service at the end of the day. So, for example, somebody can keep. And sometimes somebody would say maybe this is storage. Mm. Like, for example, you may see many storage locations where yeah. for a monthly fee, you're able to keep your belongings there because you may have more belongings than you're able to keep in your house, for example. Mm. That's not a problem. Or if you have a safe, for example, or, for example, there's other people who, who are hired services to keep uh, or transport people's income, for example. All of these things can perhaps prote protect you and prevent you from delving and dealing with usury or riba, inshallah, and keep everything halal and proper and ethical and within the bounds of Islam, inshallah. Ahsantum. Now, uh, g going back to um, success, mm. for someone in order to be successful, how important or what role does the environment play mm. in, in that mindset of success? It's a brilliant question you've asked, that how important is your environment in order to lead to success or the mindset of success? And the answer is it's very important. Your, your environment has a big, big role. We, we, we talked about some quotes, for example, if you surround yourself with five millionaires, you'll be the sixth. And if you f surround yourself with five negative people, you'll be the sixth. But I want to mention that I, if somebody who's listening, one of our viewers who feels like they're not in the best place in the world right now economically, maybe they're not in the best neighborhood, maybe they're mm -hmm. not surrounded by the best people, uh, I don't want you to lose hope. I don't want that viewer to lose hope. And what I say, what I mean by that is, proximity is of two kinds. Proximity is physical proximity to be some, next to someone close physically, or mental proximity, which is very important. And mental proximity is actually sharing thoughts with successful people. And I'll refer, I'll refer to the Quran or the Ahl, or, or, or Islam with respect to this. Where Nabi Ibrahim were told that he says, Inni muhajirun ila Rabbi, that I am a I am someone who is journeying towards my Lord. I am someone who is migrating towards my Lord. Ya Ibrahim, where is your Lord not that you are migrating towards him? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is everywhere. Where are you going? The reality is he is intellectually migrating, or he's telling us to intellectually to our minds migrate towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That it's not physical proximity, Allah is everywhere. The same way when we talk about our proximity, we talk about mental proximity. So for example, I can read books of successful people throughout history. Mm -hmm. I can start by reading the books of Ahlul Bayt salam. I can read how they live their lives, for example. They may not physically be next to me, However, through proximity and intellectual mindset, I'm able to make myself closer to the Ahlul Bayt salam. Number one. Number two, I read the biographies of successful businessmen and businesswomen throughout history who have done it ethically and properly and done things the right way. I read the biographies of, for example, inventors and people who have ingenuity. Last episode or sometime we mentioned Nikola Tesla, right? A man who worked very hard, for example. Or an inventor, or an, an innovator. And what I'm saying is, you can still be in maybe not the best physical environment, maybe you don't have the best house, not the best car, maybe materially you don't have the best, but you can still control your ethics, the way you carry yourself, your professionalism, and your mindset. You can sit in maybe the worst of places, but still have the mentality of the most successful people in the world. You can have the mentality of the Ahlul Bayt salam. You can have the mentality of the people who have flourished and thrived in this world, provided we go out and seek that through reading, through increasing our knowledge and our intellect. Warren Buffett and others, people, Charlie Munger, who's the right-hand man of Warren Buffett, who's one of the wealthiest men in the world, he says that I have not found a single person in my life who is successful who does not read. I have not found a single person. Bill Gates has said, by the way, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett both say the most intelligent person they've met is Charlie Munger. And this man is saying that I haven't found a single person in my life who has been successful at a very high level and that they didn't read. They all read. They all were re adamant and, and people who read very frequently. Books on increasing your knowledge and your intellect. Of course, it makes perfect sense. Doesn't it? And it, you sharpen up your skills as well. You sharpen up your intellect. You broaden up your 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 um, how can I word it? Maybe your your thinking. Yes. To broaden your thinking. Yes. How to think outside the box? How yes. they say? 
Definitely. Yes, absolutely. Definitely. I was speaking to some shabab here who, 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 who highlighted this notion to me. That, you know, sometimes we have a challenge of thinking about what types of big businesses to open. Mm. You know, I can only open a cafe or shisha shop or something like this, somebody may say. Mm. And the root cause of this is we need to raise our level of thinking. This is what happens. You ask Elon Musk, he's known that if you ask him, hey, Elon, he's dazing off into the sky the owner of uh, the founder of Tesla and mm. PayPal and uh, SpaceX and you ask him at dinner you know Elon what are you thinking about and he's saying I'm thinking how people would live on Mars what would their daily schedule be like what would dinner be like for them what would and he's, this is what the thoughts that he is encountering himself and this is how one should be thinking forward thinking the future you know what very successful people have in life they're able to see a vision into the future, then they're able to see where we are today, and they're able to see the gap between the two, and how we can get from one to the other, and then they execute on it. I have just condensed the formula for success in a few words, but it's a lot of hard work. Execution is where the success lies. Vision, big vision for the future, understand the status quo of where we stand today, how do we get there, and execute on it. That's it. That's how you succeed, and that's how you get further in life. Subhanallah, that's quite interesting, you know. Um, oh, I'm trying to word it. <coughs> For someone, in order to excel and be successful, mm. that means he needs to be the best at what he does. Is that correct? Sorry, I'll stop yeah, you there. It's a, it's a, I'll stop you there. Sure. We got a call on the line. Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. How are you, brother? Best at what I do and improve my business and self morale. Ah, santum. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just uh, if you could repeat the question, please, because uh, we had a small. Uh, um. My question is, how do we be the best? Just a second, if, if uh, brothers in the group could um, fix it. Because I think, say you can't hear, can you? I can't, you know. Yeah, if you can fix it, just one second. Okay. Okay, what I'll do is uh, you can repeat the question and I'll just uh, sure. um, ask the Sayyid on your behalf. Okay, um, my question is, how do I be the best at what I do? Yeah. Improve my business and self-morale. Okay, Ahsan. Thank okay, thank you, brother. Jazakumullah khair. Inshallah, say it. So basically, it's kind of connected to what we started um, discussing about. So the brother was asking, how can I be the best at what I do in uh, having a successful business and self morale? Very good. So, how can you be the best? So, the answer to the question is do you have to be the best in the world to succeed in every aspect? Um, and the answer is no. What you have to be able to do is you have to be able to identify what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are in an honest and sincere way. Where you're honest to yourself first and foremost. You have to understand and identify what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are. And if you can help get people to help you on your journey who complement you. Meaning, what your weakness is, is their strength for example. And you work together in partnership, you can get very far. Now, the question comes is, how do I identify what my strengths are and what my weaknesses That's are? That's a beautiful question. So, yeah. w one way that I uh, often recommend people is to take what's called the Myers-Briggs test, uh, which helps, it's a personality test, one amongst many other personality tests, but it's one that's very popular and famous, the Myers-Briggs personality Myers -Briggs. test. Myers-Briggs. Myers-Briggs personality test. Many people in the US, for example, take this in their high school years, but sometimes it's, a, it, it's very valuable to take this throughout your life and take it numerous times. Because who we are actually changes over time at some level as well. Hmm. And, um, or for example, maybe the, our answers, because the, what you put in is what you get out of that test. So it's about 60 questions or so that asks you about your personality to help you understand more about yourself and what you lie on. Oh, and so it will give you a combination of four letters. For example, E or I. Are you extroverted or introverted? for example, right? And you go through that whole line and it will give you some more. Or for example, say, are you intuitive or sensing? 
Are you thinking or judging or perceiving and things like this? But that's the thing, certain questions, because I remember I've tried um, some quizzes and certain questions I find it very difficult to answer because I may not know exactly what I do, mm. you know? Um, yes. Sometimes I think that a, th a, a third person might be more qualified or capable into identifying my weaknesses and my strengths. Yes. Maybe to an extent I can identify my weakness, but certain questions, like a couple of you mentioned, I would sit and think, okay, uh, do I know? Do I know? Maybe yeah. others uh, observe it because they listen to me. I may do something unconsciously or becomes like a second nature. Very good question. This is very important. So um, this is why I recommend people take it a few times, not just take the Myers-Briggs test once, take it multiple times and over time. So, mm. so do it a few times this year, then a few times next year, and then you will be absolutely certain. Uh, the other thing is these are designed, these, uh, these tests are designed by, by PhD psychologists and uh, uh, doctors of psychology, and they're designed to, to weed out bias. They're designed to take out the bias. So for example, they'll ask you some questions that seem similar, and they'll see how do you respond over time on them. Now, that doesn't mean that you're definitely one or the other. Sometimes people are on the, on the fence on a, on a particular trait. So for example, somebody may not be 100% extroverted, they may not be 100% introverted. There may be some combination of the two. And this is where it comes in. This is where the test will help you over time. I remember myself when I took it younger, there was a couple of ones that would flip-flop in terms of my personality. But when I kept doing it over time, and I even asked other people. This is where it's actually very helpful. You can ask other people, for example. Like one trait is for... Yeah, feedback. That's very important. Ask feedback. feedback from people. Like am I, for example, you can ask them, am I somebody who's always on time? Or am I someone who's a little bit late? Tell me the truth. And your friends will tell you, you know, you're absolutely on the dot every single time. Or they'll say, you know what, you're the last person to get to the show or to the party, or the, or the gathering. And then that will help you, help you make a decision. If you're truly not sure about something, ask a friend and they'll, they'll tell you, the, 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 and tell them, honest, tell me the truth, don't, don't beat around the bush. And then once you realize what that is, then you'll certain patterns. Because on the internet and on other online surveys, and uh, you can find a whole wealth of answers that will tell you about your personality, and will tell you what your strengths are. It may be that you're somebody who's caring. Maybe this is a good field for you. Maybe you're very analytical, intelligent. Maybe science and mathematics and you know, being a scientist is for you. And that, those tests will help you get a better understanding mm. of those. So I would encourage people to use those to help understand your strength. But now, do not in confuse something that's easy for your strength. I notice many times I speak to Shabab, they want, when they go to university for example, they pick, oh, I like this subject. And they'll pick something that's very easy for example. And they're not saying that really that I like the subject, they're just saying it's easy for example. Do not cheat yourself and lie to yourself or be honest with yourself. If you like a very, very, very difficult subject and that's what you feel like is that is your subject, even if it's rocket science, pursue it. And you will succeed, inshallah, by the grace of the Ahlul Bayt and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah. Ahsantum, ahsantum. Mesmerizing. Sayyidina, Allah bless you. Uh, unfortunately, once again, we've run out of time. Um, I'd like to thank you all for being with us. I hope uh, this uh, show has been as beneficial to you as it has been to us. Uh, Sayyidina, thank you once again for being with us. Um, thank, um, thank you all to the staff and the crew that makes this happen. Uh, brothers and sisters, respected viewers, uh, inshallah, uh, we'll be with you tomorrow, 6.30. Until then, um, remember us in your du'as and always pray for the hastening of the reappearance of Imam Al-Hujjah Sharif. And I wish you all a blissful and um, joyful iftar with family and friends, inshallah. Until then, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.